mean that's from for me is tonight, so tonight, this afternoon, or this morning, as it is in your part of the world. Inshallah, this discussion that we want to have tonight is about the role of Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam. And uh, specifically, we want to revisit how we have commonly understood him. And specifically, we want to look at his social, political stances that he took in his blessed life and his blessed period of imamat. The overview of what we want to discuss, so as you probably know, we have two sessions, inshallah, before us. One will be this week. Ahsan, thank you for telling me it is clear. We will have one session this week and one session in the upcoming week. So Wednesday today and Wednesday of next week. Today I want to set the grounds by talking a little bit about the uh, purpose of imamat. First we're going to look at how Imam Sadiq salam is commonly understood and what his role in history is commonly regarded as being, how most people look upon him. Then we want to look at what the role of the imam is and how that makes us have to rethink that, wait a second, that understanding that we had has certain flaws. And then inshallah, we want to go and, and go back to look at Imam Sadiq's life and see how that understanding that we had was not correct. Or the understanding that many people have is not correct. Alaikum salam, Sister Shirin. We probably won't, we won't get into the actual discussion of the life of Imam Sadiq this week. That will come next week. Inshallah, as an introduction to kind of set the scene and appreciate the situation of the society during the time of Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam, we will talk today more about before him. So the time of Imam Sajjad and Imam Baqir, alayhi salam. This is not a formal class jump in if any of you guys have thoughts or even you want to take up the mic and say something we're open to that uh, unless it gets out of hand but i don't think it will so feel free to comment at any time okay so let's begin so the common understanding that many people have and a lot of even shia these are these are shias i'm talking about who think like this about imam sadiq that and a lot of this is correct. I'm not saying it's incorrect. I'm just saying it's not the complete picture of who he is. There is another dimension to his life that is not being appreciated here. So what is this common image? It is that Imam Sadiq alayhi salam was a champion of knowledge. He was given an opportunity that his fathers before him, the previous Imams, and even the latter Imams that came after him, they didn't have that opportunity. That opportunity was kind of freedom because of the fight and struggle between the Banu Umayyah who were on their way out and the Banu Abbas who came in. There was a period of time where the Imams had, the Ahlul Bayt salam had more freedom and as a result, Imam Sadiq took advantage of that for what? For propagating knowledge. So he was a teacher. He was somebody who had thousands of students who were studying at his feet. Uh, let me also read some quotes to you in the process. Uh, just give me one sec. Uh, let me start my computer, so I'm just loading this up again. But yeah, essentially the way that Mahadik is being looked at for me is that Oh, you can't hear me. I apologize. I don't know where I am is having issues today. I have a good quality for some reason. It's uh, cutting a little bit. There's nothing I can do right now. I hope my voice is coming clearly. Let's try to disconnect and reconnect. Is my voice still coming unclearly? Um, I'm just going to keep talking so you can hear me. Okay, inshallah, it's getting better. I apologize for these technical difficulties. 
Okay, so I was saying that the common understanding with which Imam Sadiq alayhi salam is viewed is that he was a champion of knowledge. Somebody who is recognized and appreciated and remembered and his role in history was what? Was that he spread knowledge. He established a university, quote unquote, in Medina and people from all over the Muslim world came to study at his feet. He trained students in many, many different disciplines Islamic sciences, even other natural sciences. There would be people who would come from Sham and who would want to debate with the Imam. And the Imam would say, go and debate with my students. You have a question in Kalam, go to Hisham bin Hakam. You have a question in this field, go to Aban bin Taghrab. You have a question in this field. And one by one, his students would be able to defeat these people in debates. So this is the kind of role that Imam Sadiq is remembered for, which is correct, which is true. I'm not saying it's not true. Or, for example, the amount of ahadith that we have from Imam Sadiq is way, way more than from any other one of the imams, which is a true. Something that about 70% of our fiqh has come exclusively from Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam. There's a famous quote from one of the companions Imam al-Rada alayhi salam and also a companion of Imam Hadi alayhi salam. This is a, a muhaddith, a Shia scholar whose name was Hassan bin Ali al-Washah. Hassan bin Ali al-Washah, he lived after the time of Imam Sadiq. He was a contemporary of Imam Raza alayhi salam, Imam Jawad, Imam Hadi alayhi salam. And he narrates that like I sat in the Masjid of Kufa and I saw 900 scholars over a long period of time, of course. I saw 900 scholars come and go from the Masjid of Kufa. Every one of them was narrating things from Imam Ja'far. So this is the idea of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq being an eminent scholar, somebody who the entire Muslim world was filled with his knowledge. I quote Shaykh Mufid in Irshad. He says, none of the other Ahlul Bayt, none of them met as many of the reporters of tradition as he did, as Imam Sadiq did. Nor did, basically, I'm just summarizing what he says, nor did the other, these narrators, transmit on the authority of others as much as they transmitted from Imam Sadiq. And basically, 4,000 people were those who narrated from Imam Sadiq, alayhi salam. Okay, so, so far, this is basically what Imam Sadiq is remembered for, that his knowledge and his role in in basically spreading Shia knowledge or Islamic knowledge. So far, I'm not saying it's wrong, it's definitely correct, but we'll see inshallah it's lacking in something. Now the next point that we may also have in our mind, definitely some of the Shia have this in their mind about Imam Sadiq, this becomes slightly more problematic. Another common opinion that people have of Imam Sadiq is that he avoided any political interference. He, for example, then people will, you might hear people say that, oh, Zayd, the son of Imam Sajjad, that was the uncle, the chacha of Imam Sadiq, who was similar in age to Imam Sadiq, he was like an extremist. He rose up and fought. But Imam Sadiq, he didn't do that. His role was like, he didn't see that as being correct. And so what he was advocating was to not get involved in politics, to just sit down and teach. And so his, his, his role was that of a teacher. In fact, we have stories that people may also even quote at times that I want to talk about right now, that sometimes the imam would go even further than that. Not that he would not just not get involved in politics, but that he would, under the guise of taqiyya, he would praise the caliph. He would, you know, like flatter the caliph to his face so that the caliph would not kill him or would not hurt him or would not do some injustice to the Shia or to him. So this is the common image that a lot of people have of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. But what I want to try to present today is another image of Imam Sadiq, one that is not in line with this image. I want to say that this image that people have of Imam Sadiq is in fact fundamentally flawed. It has some serious serious problems. If we were to accept that this was the role of Imam Sadiq, isn't there something in us that has some kind of issue with this? Imagine that 
in a world where there is so much injustice happening, where the caliph is carrying out so much cruelty and the many of the Sadat and the Shia are living in abject poverty and oppression, the only concern Imam Sadiq salam, has, God forbid, the only concern he has is to debate with an atheist. The only concern he has is to prove that like, you have to pray namaz with your hands open and not with your hands closed. Isn't that, God forbid, if that was true, wouldn't that be a blemish? Wouldn't that be a fault? If somebody were to say, no, no, okay, Imam Sadiq, he, he, didn't, he wasn't happy with those bad people, the Banu Umayyah, Banu Abbas, but there was nothing he could do about it. Again, really? As the Imam, as a powerful leader, as somebody who thousands of people, if not like hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, love and listen to and respect, he couldn't take any stance against these cruel and oppressive leaders? Would that not be his responsibility in line with Islamic teachings. So that's what we want to, inshallah, dwell upon today and, and also next week. And I want to show that, no, definitely this is not the case. All of the imams had a very smart and calculated and wise political, social agenda that they were following and carrying out that unfortunately has been forgotten. And people don't think about that when they think about the imams. Another fundamental problem with this image of the Imam is that it is based at times on narrations that are weak and are very uh, doubtful as to how true they are. Specifically, what I'm mentioning here is one story that is narrated in multiple narrations, even in early books of Ahadith, such as Kitab al-Irshad of Sheikh Mufid, rahmatullahi alayhi. And in other books, Alama Majlisi has brought this in Bihar al-Anwar, there is a specific story of an encounter between the Abbasid Caliph Mansur and Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, where Imam Sadiq really praises Mansur. Mansur is upset with Imam Sadiq. He wants to kill Imam Sadiq. And, and therefore, to his face, Imam Sadiq starts to flatter him and says that, no, no, I'm not working against you. And even if I were... You are a descendant of Prophet Sulaiman and Prophet Ayyub. Prophet Sulaiman was given things by God and he gave thanks. And Prophet Ayyub was tested and he had patience. So you also, it behooves you to also have patience. And you know, like he, he flatters Mansur, this oppressive, horrible caliph. This is the same Mansur who maybe you've heard that in the building of the city of Baghdad, how many innocent Sadat were killed. They would put the sadat between the walls of the buildings I've heard. And definitely there are such stories, if not that specific story, there are such stories about the brutality with which he would treat the Ahlul, the descendants of Imam Hassan and Imam Ali alayhi salam. So this same horrible Caliph Mansur, the first powerful and strong Caliph of the Banu Abbas, the second Caliph of the Banu Abbas, but the first one who really established the Caliphate of the Banu Abbas, Imam Sadiq, the leader of the Shia, the Ma'asum Imam, the true heir of Imam Ali and the Holy Prophet he is talking, he's lying to Mansur in this horrible way, praising Mansur in such a way, really? Here some of our ulama have gone and tried to look into these ahadith, these specific ahadith about this story, and they realize that the chain of narrators that this ahad, these ahadith are coming from is very, very weak. Specifically, the hadith goes back to one of the people who was working for the Banu al-Abbas. One of the henchmen of Mansur is the person who first narrated this hadith. That should make it clear, right? Like, what do we expect from such a person? Somebody who is buddy-buddy with Mansur, somebody who is working with the Banu al-Abbas, of course, he would have a vested interest in making Imam Sadiq look like this. Look like he is humbling himself before Mansur, praising Mansur. So that's also one of the other things that we need to keep in mind, that some of these stories based on which we are developing our understanding of Imam Sadiq, we are understanding Imam Sadiq to be a quietist, somebody who is not active politically. At times, we are basing it on such a hadith that are very, very doubtful whether they are true or not. 
Everybody's still with me, right? Like my voice is coming clearly, inshallah. You can just message on the attendee chat. Okay. Okay, let's move on, inshallah. So that was the common image of Imam Sadiq. Before we come to start looking at history and how the Imams really were, let's start off with a kind of Kalami belief, aqaidi discussion of what is the philosophy and the role of an Imam. You see, to understand what the role of an Imam is, we need to go back to what the role of the Prophet is. I don't just mean our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I mean all Prophets of Allah. What was their purpose? What was their mission? It is in that light that we can then understand who an Imam is. Because an Imam is the successor to the Prophet. He is the continuation of that prophetic mission. And so the point that I want to focus on here is that it's true that the Prophets came to reform people's akhlaq. It's true that the Prophets came to increase our spirituality, increase our sabr, increase our goodness with which we interact with our wife and our children and our patients and all these things. But part of that submission to God that the Prophets of Allah came to teach us, part of that was definitely reforming the society at large. Look at this verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al Hadid. لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْمِيزَانَ لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ So that mankind, why did we send our prophets with these bayinat, with these manifest proofs? We sent with them the book and the mizan. That is like we sent with them the sharia, this this like way of living, this way of submitting to God. We taught people what to do to be a good servant of Allah with the idea that people would hear the English that I put before you says that so that mankind may maintain justice. But perhaps that's not a good English translation. It says, So that mankind can stand up. So that mankind can establish with strength. They can establish this kind of servitude of God in society. And so if that is the goal of the Prophet, to establish a society based on submission to Allah, then definitely the Imam is tasked with carrying that goal forward. And we will see this very clearly that in addition to being a belief of ours, this is the reality of what happened in history. That the Imams were tirelessly, continuously striving towards rectifying society at large and fixing the ills in society. And so basically, let, let me just give a parable here that, you know, most of you, I'm sure your brothers and sisters here, you live in a non-Muslim society many years ago, and you've, you've experienced firsthand the difficulties that come with that. Living in a non-Muslim society, how hard is it for a sister to have chastity and modesty? How many of our children in a Muslim society, even though we love them, we try to teach them Islam, still many of our children, because of the ill effects of that society, they end up being negatively affected by that. God forbid they don't even, like God forbid they go away from servitude to Allah. So what I want to say is that society has a very, very important effect on people. There's no doubt about that. And so the goal of Allah Ta'ala, the goal of Islam, is to establish a society that takes people en masse, as they would say, like in, in huge numbers, people are taken by the tide is pushing people towards servitude of Allah. The same way that in a non-Muslim society, it is so difficult for a woman to be chaste and modest. In a Muslim society, it should be the opposite. If people are not chaste and modest, it should be hard for them. The tide should be pushing them to live a life of purity and piety. And so there's no doubt about that, that this is part and parcel of Islam. This is a goal that Islam has. And so therefore we see that the Imams had to also continue that goal and, and work towards that end. And so if you wanted to summarize the role of the Imam, we can say he has two roles that he has to fulfill. One is intellectual, ideological. That is the light, the, the image that we normally think of the Imam in especially Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. 
So part of the Imam's role is that, definitely, that they have to explain the religion to us. They have to clarify things for us. They have to teach us. They have to tell us what does the Qur'an mean when it says so-and-so thing. They have to teach us what do I need to do in my life to go closer to God. Okay, that's there as well, no doubt about it. The intellectual, educational dimension of the Imam is there. But part of the goal of the Imam is to establish a society based on submission to Allah. And so the Imam also has that role. And as we will see now, that did actually happen in this history. The Imams were working towards that goal. And when they got the chance, they did establish such a society. Feel free again if you guys have any questions or comments. I'm, I'm all ears. I know that we probably won't finish the material I have in mind, but I'm more than happy to hear from you guys. Okay, if there is nothing though, let us continue. So, if we look at the lives of the Imams, this 250 year period from when the Holy Prophet he passed away and left this world until the Ghaybat al Sughra started of our Imam, Ajlallah Khalajah al Sharif. We have from the year 11 AH, that too is the very beginning of the year 11 AH, till the year 260, so about 250 years. We can overall divide this period into four different times, four different periods, based on the political and social agenda that the Imams were carrying out in that time. That's not to say that it was exactly the same in every one of these four periods that like Period number one from the beginning to the end was the same. Period number four from the beginning to the end was the same. No, no, that's not the case. Uh, we don't want to simplify it that much. That's not true. But overall, we can divide it into four different periods. What are these four different periods? The first period is from that time that the very sad event of Saqifa transpired and the wilaya, the leadership, no wilaya, rather the, the overt rulership of the Muslim ummah was usurped from Imam Ali alayhi salam until the day that the people came and pledged bay'ah to Imam Ali and they put him in power. That 25 year period was a period where it was the only period where the Imams were not working towards an Islamic government. They were not working towards establishing a true Islamic society. Why? Because this was such a delicate time. Islam was at danger. And so Imam Ali alayhi salam didn't have any choice other than to not just be quiet. You know this, this, this term that he sat in his house for 25 years, that's not really correct. Rather, Imam Ali was actually helping those first three caliphs whenever he could. They wanted to ignore him. They tried whatever they could to make him be forgotten by society. But at times when they needed his help, he was there to help them. And there are many such incidents where he came to help them. Look at this letter. This is letter number 62 in Nahj al Badagha, where Hazrat Amir alayhi salam gave this to Malik, Malik al Ashtar to give to the people of Egypt. And he's telling the people of Egypt what happened after the death of the Holy Prophet. He says initially that, like, I never imagined that this would be taken away from the Ahlul Bayt, this rulership, that it would be stolen from us. But then he says, I saw that I had to not just not fight against these people who usurped my right, I had to come and help them. He says, In it, I therefore withheld my hand. Like for a while, I avoided them. I didn't do anything. Then I saw that no, people are leaving Islam altogether. People want to destroy the religion of Islam. And so I came and helped these first three caliphs because they needed my help in order to protect Islam. And so because of my love for Islam, I came and I helped them. So that was the first period where, in fact, the Imam, the Imams, or rather just Imam Ali alayhi salam, he was helping those illegitimate leaders who didn't deserve to be in charge of the Muslim Ummah. The second period was that five year period where most of it was the Khilafat of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And then for a few months only, a very sad period when Imam Hassan alayhi salam tried to continue the government of Imam Ali, but due to certain reasons that we don't have time to go into, he was forced to sign that peace treaty with Muawiyah and abdicate the throne. 
So in this period, we see this is a true example of Islamic government. Forever in history, forever in the hearts and minds of the Shia, this five-year period remained in their minds. That this was when, this was the goal, to have the imam at the helm of power. And the imam, of course, when he was at power, he embarked upon a very strong and very unflinching agenda of implementing true Islamic values in society. In his first khutbah that Imam Ali salam gave after people pledged allegiance to him, he warned them, he warned them that now that I am the caliph, you will be, as it says here in this quote, you will be severely subverted and bitterly shaken as in seething and fully mixed as by spooning in a cooking pot. He's saying, I'm going to shake you guys up. I'm going to change everything. That that kind of advantage that the rich people used to get under Omar and Uthman, that's not going to happen anymore under me. There's going to be a very different system that you're going to have to abide by if you want me to be your leader. So your low persons become high and your high persons become low. Those great pious individuals who had been forgotten in the society of Uthman, who had been abandoned in the society of Uthman, these are now going to become leaders in my society. Whereas those power-hungry, immoral people like Talha and Zubair, who had been high in the society of Uthman and before Uthman, these are going to become low people in my society. They don't have any value in the society of Ali, alayhi salam. So this was the second period of time. And just to make it quick because of the lack of time, the third and fourth period are similar in that both, so the third period is from the time that Imam Hassan alayhi salam was forced to abdicate the throne and sign that peace treaty with Muawiyah until the tragedy of Karbala. And then the fourth period is the 200 period, 200 year period from the tragedy of Karbala up until Qaybat al-Suhra. In both the third period and the fourth period, the Imams are working towards retrieving their haqq. They are working towards establishing an Islamic government. They are working towards putting themselves in power, essentially. To, to just say it bluntly, that's what they were working towards doing. But the times were different. And so in the third period, there was a, a, a very high chance that they could achieve that goal very soon. And so they were working for the short term. They were thinking that, okay, any time now, we're going to launch an uprising, we're going to get rid of Muawiyah, we're going to get rid of Yazid, and we are going to establish a true Islamic government. Whereas in the fourth period, it was more long term. Even there, it wasn't always the same, as maybe we'll get a chance to mention, but essentially in the fourth period, it was clear that no, long-term, fundamental, foundational work needs to be done. Um, Inshallah, I'll make some more points about that as we go forward. But basically, this is an overview of the political stances that the Imams were carrying out, if we wanted to divide it into different sections over the time that the Imams were in, uh, present in the Muslim world, as in not the time of play, but this is what we could do. My voice is still coming clearly, right? I'm worried that I am not getting cut off and you guys are not able to hear. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Okay, so in the remaining time, let's look a little bit at the situation in this fourth period that I just mentioned. So that is starting with the tragedy of Karbala. Just after the tragedy of Karbala, what was the Muslim world like? What were the stances that the Imams were taking? And this will allow us to slowly work our way into the time of Imam Sadiq and what were his stances that he could take? And what did he actually do? Which we will talk about next week. Inshallah. Yeah, I just wanted to make one more thing that I uh, comment that I forgot about that. You know, okay, let me just make another comment that uh, the role of the leaders in society is not to be underestimated. The, the effect that a Islamic government with a true Islamic leader has the trickle-down effect that that has on the common people of society is very, very strong. There's a saying, some people have, like, it's narrated in books of hadith, but apparently there's debate. It doesn't appear like it's really a hadith. It's more like an Arabic saying that 
An-nasu ala dini mulukihim. The people are on the religion of their kings. And if we think about it and we look in history, we look in the world today, we will see that this, there is a reality here to this statement. That, okay, there are some people who are very strong. There are some elite intellectuals in a society who will themselves think about what they are doing and they will themselves work out what is the right thing they want to do and they will be strong and do that. But for many, many people in society who are not those elite intellectuals or those strong people, they just go with the flow. If the society is moving in a certain direction, they will be taken with that tide. And, and this reality is even there in the Holy Quran. For example, in one verse in Surah Ibrahim, we have وَبَرَزُوا لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا فَقَالَ الضَّعْفَاءُ لِلَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا إِنَّا كُنَّا لَكُمْ تَبَعًا فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُغْنُونَ عَنَّا مِنْ عَذَابِ اللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ That the, the weak people, those people who just went with the flow, on the Day of Judgment, they will tell those arrogant people who are strong, who are elite, who are taking them towards Jahannam, that we were following you. It's your fault that today we have to go to hell. Can you not avail us? Can you not help us? And I don't know if it's in this surah or in other surahs where similar discussions are there. Those people say, no, we can't do anything for you today. Today, you yourself did those bad actions and you have to face the consequences. Inshallah, somebody has asked about the Tawabi movement. I will mention it briefly, inshallah. Um, but the idea is this, that the, the society is very, very deeply and profoundly affected by its leaders. And, and I would uh, humbly request you, dear brothers and sisters, to really take that point forward and look in the world today. Look at the different kind of societies we have. Look at the situation of, in one society when there is a pious, pure individual at the helm of it versus when you have a very immoral person at the helm of it. What, what happens in the long run? You don't see these changes maybe right away, but over decades, over decades, you see this society is moving in a certain direction because of its leaders. Anyways, so now let's move back to the life of Imam Sajjad Alayhi. Salam. Okay, so basically Imam Sajjad inherited and when he became the Imam in the year 61 AH on that tragic day of Ashura, he inherited a very, very difficult situation. Subsequent to the tragedy of Karbala, Yazid also attacked the cities of Mecca and more so Medina and many, many people were killed. Such disgusting crimes were committed by the army of Yazid that I cannot even mention them to you right now in the city of Medina. Um, and then afterwards, many Shias revolted in, in Kufa. There was the government of Mukhtar and um, the Tawabin were a movement of Shia that were penitent and repenting for not helping Imam Hussein. So in their repentance to Imam Hussein, they went and tried to fight against the Banu Umayyah and they were killed in huge numbers. So that very, very difficult situation where the Shia community had been, if not wiped out, many of them had been killed and the remaining ones had been scared to death, like really, really terrified. That was the situation that Imam Sajjad alayhi salam inherited. We have very interesting ahadith where one of the ahadith says that after Imam Hussein, everybody became a murtad other than three people. And these three elite Shia companions, their names are mentioned. Murtad means somebody who does blasphemy, who leaves the religion altogether. And so our ulama, they have interpreted this hadith as saying that no, it doesn't mean that. It means that there were only three people left who had that courage to actually work for the social agenda of the Imam, of Imam Sajjad. Otherwise, the vast majority of the Shia, there were still, definitely still thousands of people who were Shia in the sense of loving the Ahlul Bayt, in the sense of preferring the Ahlul Bayt over the other Khulafa. There's no doubt about that. We still had lots of Shia, but they had been totally, totally scared and they were not ready to do any social action. They were not ready to do any, make any movement, political movement for helping the Imams. In addition, so, okay, maybe we still had a large Shia community, but still, the Shia community was small with respect to the larger Muslim world. And we still had a lot of ignorance, a lot of people who are not 
practicing, again, like I said, because these were times where the leaders of society were immoral and sinful people that affected society. In these years, in the first century of Hijra, imagine, in the first century of Hijra, alcohol and music were so rampant in the Muslim world that like these things are narrated that this kind of music or these musicians, these people would do these things in Mecca and Medina and these holy cities. So this was the, the horrible situation that Imam Sajjad had inherited. And another important lesson that had been clarified, not that the Imam needed to learn something, of course the Imam's knowledge is from Allah, but a clear lesson had been shown to everybody that this kind of political movement, if the Imams want to embark upon it, it needs supporters, it needs people who have been trained, who are willing to sacrifice, who are willing to shoulder that difficulty of establishing and maintaining a true Islamic government. Why was it that Imam Hassan alayhi salam was forced to sign a peace treaty? Why was it that Imam Hussein alayhi salam did not like overtly, of course, I'm saying overtly, Zahiran, he didn't succeed in his attempt to rise up against Yazid. Of course, Imam Hussein, like in another sense, definitely he succeeded. The fact that we, till now, we remember him and his movement has inspired and woken people up forever throughout history, that is a huge success. There's no doubt about that. But in the sense of actually overthrowing Yazid and defeating Yazid and establishing an Islamic society, in that sense, Imam Hussein didn't reach that goal. Right? Why did these things not happen? Because there were not enough Shia there to help them. There were not people who were willing to sacrifice to enough numbers of people to be there for their Imam. And so basically Imam Sajjad knew that what he had to do was not rise up and fight. It was to train, to educate, to nurture the community, to show them what Islam is all about. And so that, we see that in the time of Imam Sajjad, there was not that much open stances. There were not that many open stances that Imam Sajjad took against the Caliph. As we see in latter Imams, like Imam Qadim, for example, we see at times Imam Qadim very bravely and very openly telling Harun al-Rashid some like, strong things, that this, uh, political things that, you know, we, you don't deserve to be on the throne. This is our, this is the right of the Ahlul Bayt. Or even Imam Baqir alayhi salam and Hisham, one of the latter, later caliphs, we don't see that at the time of Imam Sajjad because we don't see so much of that at least because the situation was much, much more dangerous. The Shia were weak and the Banu Umayyah were very strong. Abdul Malik, the caliph at the time of Imam Sajjad was the most powerful caliph of all of the Banu Umayyah. Despite this, despite this overall generalization that I made, that the Imam was not able to take a strong political open stance, and instead he had to work on training people. He had to work on teaching people what Islamic values are all about, helping the spirituality of people and helping the ma'arifa of people go higher. Despite that, there are some stories that very clearly indicate that in at times Imam Sajjad did take a very strong stance against the Caliph. History has recorded these to forever show that Imam Sajjad was not somebody who, just because he was not openly speaking up against the Banu Umayyah or openly taking a strong political stance, it was not the case that he agreed with what they were doing. It was not the case that he let his companions have this kind of idea of Islam being an Islam that is okay with oppressive rulers. No way. For example, some of these stories, there's three stories I have. One of them I won't mention because I had mentioned it in an earlier course that Alhamdulillah had the opportunity to teach for the academy. That first story is to do with a letter that he wrote to Zuhri. Zuhri was one of the eminent ulama who was working for the Banu Umayyah. And Imam Sajjad very strongly rebukes him and says that like, you know, you are going to be responsible. How dare you do this? The your, the least crime that you have done is that you have like made this horrible oppressive ruler look to be a good person because with your knowledge you as a scholar are like giving justification and legitimacy and a nice face to this oppressive ruler. That was one story, I won't go into it right now, but two other stories of Imam Sajjad that very quickly I want to mention that show his strong stance that he took against the Caliph. One of them was this, that 
Um, yeah. At one time, Abdul Malik bin Marwan, the Umayyad Caliph, he found out that the sword of the Holy Prophet is with Imam Sajjad. So he wrote a letter to Imam Sajjad asking that Imam Sajjad give that sword as a gift to the Caliph. Maybe he was worried that the sword of the Prophet could be a, a rallying point. People would be very you know, inspired by it and they would come and they would come and support Imam Sajjad. Anyways, for some reason or the other, he wrote this letter to Imam Sajjad and Imam Sajjad refused. He responded saying, no, I'm not going to give you this word. Then, again, Abdul Malik, this time he wrote a letter. Oh, by the way, in the first letter, he said that, look, uh, please give me this word and if there's anything I can do for you, you tell me your hajat, I'll help you out as well. But Imam Sajjad refused. The second time he writes a letter, this time he's threatening him. He says that if you don't give me the sword, I'm going to cut off any money you're getting from the government treasury. Now, this, look at this response. Imam Sajjad, very strongly, he responses. He says, Amma ba'd. So he writes a letter going back to Abdul Malik the Caliph. He says, Amma ba'd fa inna Allah dhamina lil muttaqeen al makhraj min haythu yakrahoon wal rizqa min haythu la yahtasibun. He says that God has, he tells Abdul Malik, Imam Sajjad tells Abdul Malik, that God has promised the pious people that he will help them out. He will help them out of any difficult situation that they are in, and he will give them sustenance from the place that they don't even expect. And then Imam Sajjad quotes the verse of the Quran that Allah also said, Jalla dhikruhu inna Allah la yuhibbu kulla khawanin kafur. That Allah, verily Allah, does not love anybody who is treacherous and, and disbelieves, is like a disbelieving, ungrateful maybe person. And then Imam Sajjad says, so now Abdul Malik, look and see who does this apply to. From the two of us, who is this verse talking about? Oh, what a, what a harsh response that Imam Sajjad is giving to Abdul Malik. In another lengthy letter, I won't read it, but again, it's a very strong letter, where Imam Sajjad, at one point, he freed one of his slaves, a lady who was working for him. He freed her, and then he married her. And Abdul Malik had a spy in Medina who reported this to him. And Abdul Malik wrote a letter rebuking Imam Sajjad that, how could you do this? He said, my spies have informed me that you freed a slave and married her when there are other noble people in the Quraysh, noble women that you could have married. And like, you know, what are you doing, like, basically? And so Imam Sajjad, again, writes a, a long and very strong response to Abdul Malik that, that like, I did this and this is the sunnah of the Prophet and there's nothing wrong. The only thing that's wrong is this jahili culture that you have. In this hadith that narrates this letter, it's narrated that when he reads it, Abdul Malik gets upset and he throws the letter to his son. And his son reads it and his son is like shocked. He says, how like he's... he's Imam Sajjad has spoken to you in this way and then uh, Abdul Malik tells him that you know leave him alone these are the Banu Hashim whose tongues are so sharp that they can split the rocks anyways my point being that even Imam Sajjad despite that difficult situation of the Shia he had certain stories such as these certain ahadith that show that at times he did take this kind of very strong stance okay my point is this, uh, inshallah, I have some things about Imam al-Baqir that now I want to also mention to you. But my overall point is this, that dear brothers and sisters, the Shia at that time were a community that were in their essence very, very political. You know, to be a Shia, if not, if not the fundamental quality, then definitely one of the main qualities of being a Shia was that you wanted your imam to be the one in power. You had this deep grudge and animosity with these oppressive leaders, and you wanted the imam to be the one who would be put in power. That's what it meant to be a Shia. And even though at times the imams were not able to openly fight against the khulafa, definitely this sentiment of animosity towards oppressive leaders and this sentiment of not being happy with the status quo was part and parcel of what it meant to be a Shia. Anyways, from the time of Imam ba uh, Sajjad, we move on to the time of Imam Baqir. So Imam Sajjad's imamat was for very long. It was from the year 61 AH up until the year 
95, more than 30 years, Imam Sajjad was growing the Shia community, this young, nascent, weak community. He was growing it, giving it strength, giving it confidence, giving it knowledge, giving it taqwa, and then, you know, creating these links. That's another discussion altogether about how the idea of wilaya is a bond amongst the Shia community. Anyways, because of this tireless work over a 30-year period, Imam Baqir alayhi salam now, when he becomes the Imam, he inherits a much better situation. The Shia community has now grown. It's more powerful. It's more stronger. We can see based on a hadith of the people that would come to Imam Baqir that now the Shia are not just located in Medina and Kufa. Now far away from the capital of the Muslim world, all the way in Khurasan, parts of Iran, we have Shia communities. People are Shia in large numbers. They come to Imam Baqir. They ask him ahkam questions. On the other hand, another important point is that the Umayyad Caliphate now is getting weaker and weaker. It's only going to be like 15 years after the death of Imam Baqir that the Umayyads are going to be overthrown. So the, the Caliphs who came afterwards, uh, although Hisham was more of a strong Caliph, Hisham was during the time of Imam Baqir as well. He was the one that poisoned Imam Baqir. But some of these Umayyad Caliphs at least were not that strong leaders. They were more interested in just engaging in entertainment and pleasure and enjoying life. Of course, the situation in the Muslim world as a whole was still very bad in terms of injustices, in terms of sin, in terms of moral, spiritual, economic problems. A lot of problems and social ills were there, as, I, as I've been saying this whole time, that because of a bad government, what else can we expect? When the leaders of society are like that, then we can't expect that society will be any better, right? So what was Imam's... Uh, was his hands were slightly freer than those of Imam Sajjad his situation was a little bit better the Shias were stronger on the one hand the enemies were weaker on the other hand okay. so what was it that Imam Baqir was able to do basically there's four points that I've made here again I'm not going to go into all of them one for a lack of time and secondly because some of these things I mentioned in earlier classes there was a a series of classes that I had done a year or two years ago for the academy, which was called the social political role of the Ahlul Bayt, Some of these points I mentioned over there, so I don't want to repeat them. But overall, I'll just summarize these four points, and then I'll I'll give you some stories, and we will end with that, inshallah. So one one of the very influential and important groups in society, in any society, but in particular in that society at that time, were the scholars and the poets. The poetry was a very common form of, like you can say, entertainment at that time. Everybody would love poetry, recite poetry, children, women, men. There are stories that really indicate that poetry was extremely common at that time. And so these people had a huge influence on the minds of the common people. At times, their role was not even less than though that role of the government. The same way the government was responsible for the problems in society, these people were also responsible for problems in society at times. So here we see that Imam Bakr very smartly and very bravely, he takes advantage of these groups of society. He, on the one hand, he rebukes people who are working for the government, scholars who are just helping the Banu Umayyah and are just not showing people how Islam should cause you to wake up and resist against oppression, Imam Bakr would rebuke such scholars very strongly. Or similarly, poets who would write, recite poetry in favor of the Caliph, Imam Bakr would rebuke such poets. Specifically, there was a poet called Kuthayyir in one hadith, one story. And there was a, an, an alim known as Ikrama. Uh, an eminent narrator of hadith amongst the Ahl Sunnah, who was both of these were basically helping the Banu Umayyah. And Imam Baqir, in certain ahadith, he rebukes them. He meets them and he's very harsh with them. But how dare you do this? You are responsible. You are just like a slave in the hands of the Banu Umayyah. On the other hand, we see that Imam Baqir 
Specifically, we have one Shia poet who was very important and very influential, and he recited a lot of poetry that has remained with us till now. His name was Kumait. May Allah be pleased with him. In the end, he was martyred because of his love and his poetry for the Ahlul Bayt. We see that Imam Baqir and Imam Sadiq, they, they support him immensely. They give him so many gifts. At a time when the Imams didn't even have much money, they give tons of money to support Kumait al-Asadi. Kumait was the one who, when everybody else was scared to help the Imams, he would bravely come forward and recite poetry in support of the Imams and attacking the Banu Umayyah. Another, another point is that the Imams would get people's minds ready. They look, we Shia, like the, when they were with their Shia, two of the things, these next two points that I've written on these, I've written on these slides here, is that they would remind people, A, that one day this government will come back in our hands. This, the Imams, we are working towards returning that right to us, and one day we will get this right back to us. This is there in many ahadith. There are hadith that say that they have this code word, you can say, Al-Amr, or Amruna, Amruna Ahlul Bayt, that our affair, that one day our affair will happen, or those, may Allah bless those people who are working towards our affair, our Amr. This, it's very clear for people who like have study history, and at least, I mean, at least some of our ulama would say that it's very clear that this is referring to establishing that Shia government, that Islamic government with, the Imam at the helm of it. Inshallah, I'll show you guys two stories with regards to these two points. There. First of all, preparing people that one day this will happen. And then second of all, reminding people of who the Imam is. That you know, What is the Imam's role in terms of leading the Muslim community and having that fundamental role? Which is, of course, on the one hand, a spiritual role, but also a kind of political role of leading the Muslim community. The last thing that I want to say that I won't be able to show you examples of, but again, in that previous class, I had talked about it, some examples at least briefly, is that we can see the strong stances that Imam Baqir and even other Imams took simply in the fact that the caliphs were very, very scared of them. The caliphs were very harsh with them. The caliphs were throwing them in prison. The caliphs were poisoning them. You know, these kind of shrewd politicians like Harun al-Rashid, why would he want to put Imam Musa al kadhim in prison? And there are other stories like that about Imam Baqir as well, that Hisham calls Imam Baqir to Sham and then he puts him in prison for a while. And eventually he poisons the Imam. These caliphs were worried about their own throne. They were not idiots. Harun al-Rashid is somebody who everybody in history recognizes him, recognizes him as being a very, very smart politician. Why would they risk, why would they take the risk of, of getting the, you know, wrath of the Muslim Ummah? So many Muslims love the Imam clearly, and they're going to just go and poison the Imam? They're going to throw the Imam in jail? Clearly, they were very worried about the Imam. They were so worried about the Imam that they judged, in their, in their judgment, it was safer to have the Imam killed or have the Imam in prison as opposed to leaving the Imam to be free. What does that show us? That shows us that the Imam was a political threat to these people. They, they didn't care about like if somebody prayed with their hands open or their hands closed. Do you think they were worried about Islam? Of course not. They were worried about their own throne. And so the fact that they were enemies of the Imams indicates that the Imam was a risk to their throne. Anyways, there's so much more that we can say, but uh, we've reached our time. So very quickly, let me narrate some of these ahadith and then... I will let you guys go, insha'Allah. Uh, so one of these ahadith is the following. That, um, one day, one of the companions of Imam Baqir, alayhi salam, his name is Fudayl bin Yasar. Fudayl bin Yasar narrates that I was in Hajj and I was with Imam Baqir, alayhi salam, when Imam Baqir told me that, look at all these people doing tawaf. This is the way people used to also do tawaf in the time of jahiliyyah. Oh, what a statement. Imam Baqir, these are Muslims, those were kuffar. How can you say that? Imam Baqir, he goes on to say that these people, this is the way they used to do tawaf in the time of jahiliyyah. What's the difference? What's, what, what should they be doing? Oh, Imam Baqir, what should they be doing? He tells Fudayl that 
they have only been commanded to do tawaf and then hasten to us and to announce their wilaya to us and to present their assistance, their nusra to us, to say that we are at your service, O Imam. And then Imam Baqir alayhi salam he quotes this verse of Quran that the verse of Quran is quoting Nabi Ibrahim alayhi salam. فَجْعَلْ أَفْئِدَةً مِنَ النَّاسِ تَهْوِي إِلَيْهِمْ The Nabi Ibrahim prays for his progeny that, O oh Allah, make the people I'm leaving my son Ismail and my wife here in this barren land of Mecca. Help them, O oh Allah. One of the things please do for them is make the hearts of the people inclined towards them. Make people love them, basically. The Imam says that this is referring to us. You see, he quotes the verse that means, Ala Muhammad, Ala Muhammad, ilayna, ilayna. That it is us that people are supposed to come to. It's us that people are supposed to love. Okay? That's one story I wanted to give you, where the Imam is clearly showing people who he is, who the Imam is. That I am the leader of the Muslim Ummah. People are supposed to do tawaf and then come to me. In another story that's a bit lengthy, so I won't read it. I'll just kind of give you the gist of it. The narrator of this story is with Imam Baqir alayhi salam in a house that is full of people. When all of a sudden an old man, he comes to Imam Baqir. He comes and he's like, he's like got a spear in his hand, like a stick in his hand that he's walking with. And he announces his wilaya to the Imam. He says, Assalamu alayka ya ibn Rasulullah wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. And then a little bit later, he comes in to the house and he says, he says to Imam Baqir, Ya ibn Rasulullah, adnini mink. He says, Ja'alani Allahu fidak. So now he's announcing his loyalty to Imam Baqir, this old man. He's saying, Fawallah inni la uhibbukum wa uhibba man yuhibbukum. وَوَاللَّهِ مَا أُحِبُّكُمْ وَأُحِبَّ مَنْ يُحِبُّكُمْ لِطَمَعٍ فِي دُنْيَا He says, O oh, oh, Imam Baqir, I want you to know that I love you, the Ahlul Bayt, it's the plural form. I love you, the Ahlul Bayt, and I love whoever loves you. And I, only lo and I do not love you and people who love you for any worldly gain that I'm going to get out of it. No, sincerely for the sake of Allah, I love you and I love whoever loves you. And then he goes on to say, وَإِنِّي لَأُبْغِضُ عَدُوَّكُمْ وَأَبْرَأُ مِنْهُ وَوَاللَّهِ مَا أُبْغِضُهُ وَأَبْرَأُ مِنْهُ لِوَتْرٍ كَانَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَهُ He goes on to give his loyalty. He says that I, I, I despise your enemies and I am far from them. And I don't do that for any kind of, you know, like they haven't killed one of my relatives that I should do that. No, no, I'm doing it for the sake of Allah. He goes on, he goes on, he says that I... I Find whatever you say to be halal is halal for me. Whatever you say is haram is haram for me. And then I wanted to focus on this. The last thing he says is this. وَأَنْتَظِرُوا أَمْرَكُمْ فَهَلْ تَرْجُوا لِي جَعَلَنِي اللَّهُ فِدَاكُ He says, I'm also waiting for your amr. Remember, I told you guys that amr is a code word in our ahadith. That means the government of the imams. He says, I'm waiting. I'm eagerly waiting for that day that we're going to live under your government, O imam. And, and then he says, may I be sacrificed for you? Is there any hope for me? Like, am I, am, am I okay? Like, am I going to be okay before Allah? The Imam, he, he talks about, like, in response, the Imam talks about how great this person's reward will be, that uh, somebody had come to Imam Sajjad with a similar statement, and Imam Sajjad said that because you are like this, when you die, if you die, you will go back to the Ahlul Bayt, and you will have this and this reward in Jannah. In lengthy, like, he goes into description of what kind of reward you're going to have, it, when you go to Jannah, and then this is the main point that I wanted to tell you guys. Then Imam Baqir says that if you are to live, وَإِنْ أَعِشْ أَرَى مَا يُقِرُّ اللَّهُ بِهِ عَيْنِي فَأَكُونُ مَعَكُمْ فِي السَّنَانِ الْأَعْلَى Sorry, one second. No, no, no. This is what Imam Baqir says to him, وَإِنْ تَعِشْ تَرَى مَا يُقِرُّ اللَّهُ بِهِ عَيْنَكْ وَتَكُونُ مَعَنَا فِي السَّنَامِ الْأَعْلَى Imam Baqir, so it's a lengthy, lengthy hadith. I only want to quote this one point. That one of the things Imam Baqir says to this man, remember the man said that I am waiting for your government. I'm waiting for your amr. And Imam Baqir says that if you live, you will see it. You will see that thing that will make you happy and you will be with us. What is he saying? He's telling him that like one day we will win. One day we will establish our government and 
you, if you are alive, you will be with us. I just wanted to show that, you know, this political dimension of being a Shia was very fundamental at that time. It was part and parcel of what the Imams were telling their Shia and what the Shia were believing. And so, you know, I, I've taken much more time than I should have, so I apologize for that. Let us leave it at that. Inshallah, I hope that this is an eye-opener for us and we, we realize that part of our identity is this. And we don't see our Imams as being like quietists who are just knowledgeable, pious people, but had nothing to do with society. No, this is very far from the reality. Uh, I thank you for bearing with me and listening to me. So, if anybody